Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Anatomy of the Triton ICS Cyber Attack, sponsored by CyberX. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Justin Searle, SANS Senior Instructor, and Phil Nire, VP of Industrial Cybersecurity for CyberX. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Phil. Thank you, Carol, and welcome everyone. Happy Easter, happy Passover, and thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon. As uh, usual, we have a content-filled hour here. I'm going to start off by talking about the Triton cyber attack. I'm going to give some of the results of the reverse engineering that our threat intelligence team did on the Triton malware, uh, put it into sort of a global context of other activities that we've been seeing, and then hand it over to Justin, who's going to talk specifically about how to secure safety systems, as well as um, how to implement an active cyber defense strategy. Now, before I start, I, I need to start with this slide because I do feel if you're in the cybersecurity community and especially if you're in the ICS security community, you may be feeling like this. There's uh, news and events and new information almost on a weekly basis that really cause us to raise our eyebrows. Uh, and I'll give you some examples here. So this is an article that showed up uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, it was about the Triton cyber attack. It had some new information that had not previously been revealed, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and one of the interesting quotes here was something that had been mentioned by us and by others uh, in the early days of the Triton uh, news being released, which was December, that really uh, this was not uh, the entire attack, what the attackers really intended to do was to disable the safety system so they could cause uh, a lot more damage than they did, which was they simply shut down the plant, which I'm sure was still uh, quite disruptive for the asset owner. But let's look at uh, a couple of other things that have happened in the last couple of months. And, and again, I've shown this slide before. I do feel like um, sometimes we feel that we're Alice in Wonderland and we're not sure what we're seeing and what it means. And I'll give you some examples here. Um, so if you look at uh, the first couple of months of the year, um, Triton was talked about for the first time in December, but then at the S418 conference, Dale Peterson's conference in Florida, we had some new information from Schneider and from others about what had happened. Uh, I'm sticking in here some other activities that have happened that are kind of part of the overall cyber context. Uh, the Department of Justice indictment of Russians and the Internet Research Agency uh, is sort of part of this overall context on a global basis. But then um, a few weeks ago, there was an FBI DHS alert confirming for the first time that Russian threat actors had successfully compromised our critical infrastructure and access a human machine interface, for example, in one of our energy facilities. Uh, there was the Times article that talked about two things. One, that it might be linked to a string of cyber attacks on other petrochemical facilities, uh, Triton was, uh, and then comments from Symantec suggesting that Iran, perhaps with help from other sophisticated uh, adversaries, had executed the attack. Uh, then there was the announcement that Gooseford 2.0, again, it's not an ICS issue, but it is part of the overall global context. Uh, the, the, the guys that supposedly um, had breached the um, Democratic uh, National, um, the Democratic Party and had pretended to be uh, um, a Romanian hacker, uh, it was uh, revealed that he really is part of the Russian military intelligence and that. Uh, that came about because of a mistake in uh, forgetting to use a VPN to log into various social media. And then last Friday, the Department of Justice indicted nine Iranians for hacking. Most of the news uh, focused on their hacking of university libraries and stealing intellectual property, which is pretty bad. There didn't seem to be an ICS security component to it until I dug into the indictment itself, um, which 
and maybe I'm maybe I'm strange. I just enjoy reading these things. They're very legalistic. There's not a lot of uh, adjectives and hyperbole. But uh, what I found was that one of the uh, victims of these Iranian hackers indicted last week was an industrial machinery company, not named. Could have been any of the industrial automation vendors that are widely used. But if I were um, a hacker trying to get into um, critical infrastructure and understand how the devices work in those facilities, uh, this would be one way for me to do it, would be to hack the email uh, a mailbox of one of these companies and just look for information that I might not otherwise be able to obtain about the memory structure, for example, of some of these devices, which we're going to see played a key role in the Triton cyber attack. Uh, if you go back to uh, two years ago, the Department of Justice indicted another group of Iranians, um, amongst other things, uh, for uh, compromising the SCADA system in the Bowman Dam in New York. Now, it didn't cause any damage. There's no big deal. You know, our, our infrastructure was not at risk. But in my mind, this might have been part of the training exercise that Iranian cyber uh, attackers were doing to learn how to compromise uh, ICS and SCADA systems. And then this article showed up based on a very detailed report by the Carnegie Institute about Iran. Most of it was about their hacking of um, uh, dissenting uh, people in Iran and, and other diplomats, but there was a, a section in this article in the New York Times where they talked about how hard it is to hire hackers in Iran, and uh, that uh, they were asking hackers during the interview, the job interview, you know, do you have any experience working with SCADA? So yet another data point that might point to the fact that they have a concerted campaign to go after our ICS and SCADA system. So let's go to the Triton specifically. So the first we heard about Triton was in December. It was actually um, the day before our previous SANS webinar that we did. And um, it was a very well-written blog post by a group of uh, well-known researchers at FireEye and Mandiant about Triton. Um, they made a few statements like their long-term objective was actually to cause physical damage. Um, they uh, compromised the safety system. And, uh, and then really the goal was to uh, disable the safety system in order to cause much more damage. So as you know, safety systems, these safety controllers are used to shut down the plant when dangerous thresholds are reached, such as uh, pressure or temperature that rises to a dangerous level in an oil storage tank, for example, and to prevent the whole thing from blowing up. But by disabling the safety system, uh, they would be able to then launch a second cyber attack. That is um, a hypothesis that we have about the purpose of this attack. Um, and then uh, a month later at the uh, ICS cybersecurity conference called S418, uh, we saw a presentation by two uh, folks from Schneider Electric. They went to, to a great level of detail about the malware. Um, they said that the reason the attackers were able to insert a backdoor into the safety controller, the PLC, was because they, there was a zero day that they were able to exploit. Um, that was the first time we'd heard it was a zero day. We just know that for whatever reason, perhaps due to the design of the controller uh, and the threat models that were in place at the time it was designed, which was years ago, uh, it might have been possible for an attacker with access to the ladder logic portion of the controller to then write into the firmware memory region of the controller. Uh, we don't know really how they did it, but I'm gonna show you specifically what they did in a few minutes. Uh, shortly after the conference, there was a Wall Street Journal article, and this was the first time we heard officially that it was a petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then the article that I mentioned before from a few weeks ago uh, that linked Triton to a series of cyber attacks on other petrochemical plants in Saudi Arabia. These were not, uh, ICS related, they were kind of like Shamoon uh, in terms of being destructive, but on the corporate IT side rather than the OT side. And they gave two examples, a company 
uh, called Tasni and another company at Sadara Chemical, which is a joint venture between Saudi Aramco and Dow Chemical. Uh, that triggered for me an interesting connection to an article that showed up in January by Chris Bing in CyberScoop, where he said Saudi Aramco helped investigate Triton. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't one of their facilities, but somehow they were related to the victim's business. And uh, so that would seem to tie into the first bullet up there about Sadara. The article also claimed that the attack was quite sophisticated. We're going to see that when we look at the malware. Uh, but that Iran, if they were the adversary, could have improved its capabilities by working with another country like Russia or North Korea. The article went on to repeat this hypothesis that it was really intended to cause an explosion that might have killed people. There was an interesting statistic that the same controllers are used in 18,000 plants around the world, not just in petrochemical, but in lots of other industries. And of course, what other folks had said, including ourselves, was that the same technique, the same trade craft could be used against other ICS systems from other OT vendors, and that the attack is being investigated by a, a host of uh, really smart folks from the US government. I'm going to, uh, before showing uh, the scenario that uh, the adversary has used, I want to talk about this report that came out in the summer from Cisco Talos and uh, had, uh, was echoed in the DHS FBI alert a few weeks ago about Russians compromising our energy sector, uh, in which uh, Cisco Talos talked about um, phishing attacks that use a resume claiming to be from a control systems engineer with experience in what you see there, Siemens, Rockwell, SCADA. Um, and uh, what the attachment did, which was unusual, we had not seen before, which is that instead of relying on macros, malicious macros in the document itself, what the document did was attempt to connect to an external SMB server that was controlled by the attackers. And so if you have your firewall permitting outbound SMB access, which you should not anymore, certainly after saying this, um, the attackers would then uh, download a file to the machine through this um, outbound connection. And that file would then be used to harvest the credentials of a control engineer inside the company, or perhaps uh, one working for a third party contractor or maintenance uh, supplier for the OT network, uh, which would then give them access to the OT network. And we've seen this time and time again, that the easiest way for uh, adversaries to get into our OT network is by stealing privileged credentials uh, and then using those to uh, get remote access to the OT network. That bypasses any network level, uh, perimeter security you might have, even any segmentation you might have. Um, so it's a great way to get right into the OT network. And since most of the devices in these networks uh, are very insecure, having very little protection in terms of authentication. Once an attacker gets in, they can use standard remote access protocols to get to them and manipulate them and compromise them. So I show this to set up this situation here, which is a hypothesis about how the attackers might have gotten to the safety controller in this Triton cyber attack. We don't really know, but we could expect that they compromised um, somebody on the IT side to steal their credentials and then use those credentials to go past the DMC directly into the OT network. Um, of course, there are other hypotheses. It could have been um, a, uh, a website drive-by attack that also stole their credentials. It could have been an insider uh, with a USB drive or an infected laptop, but we're gonna go with the phishing attack because it seems to be a favorite. Um, so after they compromised the OT network, they uh, were able to get access to an engineering workstation. Uh, many of these are older Windows boxes, so they have lots of vulnerabilities. They may have weak authentication. Um, and there they installed PC-based components of the malware, as we'll see, it was a Python-based uh, component that they installed on this PC, from which they were then able to get access to the safety controller using the Triconics native ICS protocols. They were smart enough to build a piece of malware that could speak directly to this controller in its native protocol, and they used that to install the remote access Trojan or the backdoor on the device. So that's 
sort of the last two pieces uh, are known and have been validated. The first piece about how they got in is a hypothesis. And then this piece is also a hypothesis. What was the purpose of installing the back door on the PLC? We assert that it was so they could establish a permanent tunnel to the PLC, regardless of whether the switch was in the run position, which prevents any uh, uploads to the controller, or whether it was in the program position, which is considered a bad practice, but in reality, turns out to be in that position more often than not for convenience. And from there, we surmised that they were planning to disable the safety controller and then to launch a second cyber attack that would cause massive damage and potentially loss of human life and certainly uh, potentially some environmental damage as well. So let's get into the specifics of the malware itself. Um, uh, the content I'm about to present uh, really is due to some of my colleagues, David Atch, uh, the VP of Research at CyberX. He was formerly the team lead in the Incident Response Center for the Israeli Defense Forces and George Lushenko, who served in the IDF intelligence forces. These are the guys who actually went through and reverse engineered uh, not only the Python code, which is you know, relatively simple, but uh, the PowerPC code that was actually downloaded to the controller. Um, and they couldn't be here today, but um, I'm presenting on their behalf. And the full details of what I'm presenting uh, can be seen in the blog post with the URL at the bottom there. So in summary, and I'm going to show you some examples, what the uh, adversary did was pretty smart. They, um, from the Python uh, malware, based malware on the PC workstation, they looked at the ladder logic code on the controller and built a linked list of those programs so they could safely append their own programs, uh, inject.bin being the one that installed the back door without overriding any of the original code and ladder logic code in the safety controller. So it was a way to basically be on the controller and let it continue doing whatever it was supposed to be doing. Then they uh, figured out the memory layout and the offsets in the controller firmware so that they were able to insert the back door into the firmware part of the controller without interrupting its normal operation. And as I said, that really required some detailed knowledge, which they could only have obtained through uh, extensive cyber reconnaissance, perhaps through an insider, but probably a combination of the two, uh, but probably at least uh, cyber reconnaissance. Um, and as I said before, we believe the remote access Trojan provides consistent access to the controller, even when the switch is in run mode, which would prevent any updates to the ladder logic code. And then I'm gonna show you this pretty cool custom protocol they designed to communicate with the rat. It uses uh, uh, an official um, Triconix network call, but modifies it in some way to fit their purposes and enables them to then uh, perform read, write, and execute operations on the controller. So let's look at some of these. So just a couple of components. Trilog.exe is the PY2EXE compile. That's a, a component that takes ordinary Python and uh, converts it to Windows executable. So that's why they were able to run Python on a Windows box that, that may not have had a Python uh, infrastructure. They built, uh, as I said, libraries that would allow them to communicate using uh, the standard TriStation communication libraries. They had a component called inject.bin, which places the back door in the right place. Um, and sort of in terms of the, <clears throat> the Python part, uh, given an IP address, which is the, dis the safety controller, they were able to install a first payload, which I'll show you, was kind of a test to make sure they had access to the controller, then their main payload, and then they sort of cleaned up their tracks. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Um, and as I said before, they constructed a linked list of the ladder logic programs already on the controller uh, so that they were then able to append their program to the last item on the list uh, without interrupting any of the normal flow that the ladder logic may have had. Um, and we also found that whenever they updated their own ladder logic program, they overwrote their own 
uh, ladder logic. So you can see a bunch of messy uh, programs in there, just the most recent one being theirs. Um, so one of the things they do is they check to see if they have read-write access to controller memory. What they do is they ops, uh, upload a, um, a magic number using, again, a little used network call called get CP status, and then they, they, they look to make sure um, that that magic number shows up in the right place, and that, that verifies for them that they have read-write access to the controller memory. This is uh, pretty interesting, the protocol that they used. So they used a, a different network call called get MP status. And uh, it has the structure shown there with the colors. So some standard packet headers, an opcode, a special end identifier that the attackers put in there, and some data. So if you look at it, this is from a Wireshark dump that our team did. Um, the special identifier is here, this FF. Uh, buried in the in the packet structure, and so what they do is they check to make sure that that special identifier is in the uh, get MP status packets. After which they look for a specific opcode shown there, the one seven, and that tells them what operation is going to be executed. Uh, is it read? Is it write? Is it execute? In this case, it's one seven, which is a read. And if there is no identifier, they know that it's a standard, legitimate get MP status call, and they just go through and pass it to the normal handler in the safety controller. Okay, I'm just going to do, uh, I want to show you some context here, which I think is important with respect to other nation state attacks and uh, the global environment that we live in today with the point, from the point of view of critical infrastructure. Uh, and I'm going to show you a picture in a second that has a couple of flags. So I just want to remind you what some of these flags are. Uh, the vertical lines up at the top are Russia, uh, the Democratic uh, DNK, North Korea is the one with the star, and then Iran is the one with the green. That's one way to think about it. Um, and I'm going to show you this uh, chart that I adapted from Sean McBride, McBride, who wrote a blog post on the publication War on the Rock. It was really excellent. What I've done is I've um, split this up into an animation as well as um, added some more recent events that were not part of the original blog post. So, but if you go back and you look at a history of nation state cyber attacks, I'm talking here not about breaches or data theft. I'm talking about an attack that caused some type of destruction, either DDoS, uh, not destruction, but some kind of physical, you know, some kind of real impact. So it was either DDoS, wiper, which wipes the hard drives, or physical destruction. And those are the three categories that Sean chose. And we go back to 2007. Uh, the Estonians were trying to remove a statue of a Russian soldier. The Russians weren't happy about it. And uh, the uh, website of the president and several other, you know, several other government websites were DDoS. So that's going back to 2007. Might be the first time cyber was used in a uh, geopolitical context. Then a year later, Georgia. Um, this was a few weeks before an actual military incursion in the country. Uh, where there was a DDoS attack on several other government websites. 2009, of course, we saw Stuxnet, which most folks consider the first known cyber attack on ICS. Uh, and we also saw something called Dozer, which was North Korea getting into the picture uh, with DDoS attacks both on South Korean targets, but also on the White House and the Pentagon. That was 2009. 2011, we saw an attack called Kratos. Again, uh, it was North Korea attacking South Korean sites. Uh, in this case, the occasion was the an anniversary of the Korean War. 2012, we saw the first couple of attacks from Iranian hackers, Shamoon, which was uh, very destructive on hundreds of thousands of PCs at Saudi Aramco. So that's the wiper part. Uh, and then Ababil, which was an attack on uh, U.S. financial institutions, and in that March 16th 
Department of Justice indictment, the March 2016 Department of Justice indictment, I mentioned at the beginning, that was a big thrust of their indictment, which was to get those guys, uh, name and shame the guys who did those attacks on U.S. financial institutions. Okay, I'm just waiting for the screen to catch up here. Click on it one more time, Phil. Okay, thank you, Carol. Okay, here we go. 2013, some more attacks uh, from the North Koreans. I won't spend a whole lot of time on those, but in 2014, we had some interesting attacks. The attack on Sony, um, both destructive and a data breach, caused lots of problems for Sony. Um, the attack on Ukraine uh, in advance of their elections by a group called Cyber Berkut, a Russian-linked group that uh, tried to influence the Ukrainian elections. So this might have been the first time we saw uh, the Russians trying to insert themselves into an electoral process of another country. And then the SANS attack by Iranians uh, who weren't happy with the owner of the SANS Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas and who uh, uh, destroyed a lot of uh, computers there. In 2015, we saw an attack on TV5, which is a French uh, television channel that actually destroyed their equipment. We're really not sure what that was about. Some people theorized it was a practice run, uh, but we also saw the first Ukrainian grid attack by a group like most people think it's Sandworm linked to Russia, where they took down the power grid. Um, by stealing credentials, getting remote access to the HMI, and then turning off the breakers. And we did a bunch of other things at the same time. In uh, 2016, we saw the second Ukrainian grid attack, much more sophisticated, also known as Indestroyer or Crash Override, uh, in which they built custom malware that knew how to talk to the controllers in the, in the environment using their native protocols and uh, caused lots of damage and uh, also made it very hard for the folks to recover. And then 2017, as I said, uh, we've, we've seen a busy year here. We've got Triton up at the top. Uh, we've got WannaCry, which is now uh, attributed to North Korea, uh, and NotPetya, which is now attributed to Russia. We saw last, uh, two days ago, that Boeing there were reports that Boeing facilities had been impacted by uh, WannaCry. We know that both WannaCry and NotPetya caused a lot of damage and actually shut down production, production facilities in many plants around the world, causing hundreds of millions of dollars, actually uh, over a billion dollars of damage uh, as sort of impact uh, from the point of view of lost production and cleanup costs. Uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals being one of the ones uh, most prominent in the U.S. that was hit with uh, these attacks. Uh, Shumun 2.0, which was an uh, attack on Saudi Aramco, again by Iran. And then this was, not too many people picked up on this, at the end of the year, uh, the NSA went after the North Korea with a DDoS attack that forced them to open up a second uh, internet connection via Russia to, uh, to get a little more bandwidth in case of future similar attacks. So we've talked about Iran, we've talked about Russia. I just want to mention North Korea. This came out um, last fall. It was about North Korea targeting the power grid, not like the Russians targeting the power grid. And then talking about the Russians, uh, this was a quote by a gentleman in Mr. Putin's cabinet um, late last year in which they were asserting their power uh, in the cyber domain. And it's not surprising that we're seeing Russia asserted itself in the cyber domain. This is a newspaper article that was written a couple of years ago by a general who is now part of Mr. Putin's cabinet in which he clearly stated a strategy and philosophy of uh, high, asymmetrical war or nonlinear war or hybrid war, which combines cyber and physical uh, as a way to um, assert power um, in, uh, in other places. And then uh, this excellent article, if you haven't read it yet, came out uh, last uh, fall in Wired, and it was a, a really great um, analysis of all of many of these events. 
And this quote here, I think, is very relevant today if you think about everything that's going on in the world, uh, not just in the cyber domain, but in other areas in which geopolitics are, are being uh, invoked, which is that uh, our adversaries are, are testing to see what our red lines are and uh, how we're going to react. And, and I think uh, we saw this uh, with the Ukraine 2.0, uh, and we've seen it in, in some other recent examples. So quickly now, how, how would you protect yourself against these kinds of attacks? Um, Justin's going to talk about the SANS active cyber defense model, which is a multi-layered model. This is a similar model from Gartner called the Adaptive Security Architecture. It came out a couple years ago. It wasn't ICS specific, but I'm going to talk about how it does apply to ICS environments. At the time, Gartner said that IT security folks were spending too much time on blocking and prevention and not enough time on detection and response. Um, Carol, yeah, thank you. Uh, and that uh, attackers were easily bypassing traditional firewalls and signature-based prevention me mechanisms and instead it needed to focus on continuous monitoring and uh, other technologies that you see there. I, I would say that uh, the same is very true today when you look at ICS security. ICS security for years depended on either a perception that there was an air gap between ICS networks and the rest of the world or on simple perimeter level security. As we saw in Triton uh, and in uh, the Ukrainian grid attacks and many others, uh, attackers can now bypass these perimeter level protections pretty easily especially in a targeted attack. But even in, a, in an untargeted attack, like NotPetya and WannaCry, where um, they use the SMB protocol to cross over from IT to OT uh, very quickly. So I'm going to talk about each of these quadrants now. So first of all, talk about detection. I think the biggest question today, if you are responsible for ICS security in your organization, is how do I detect, how do I even know if an attacker is in my network, right? Um, and I'm going to show you some screenshots from our technology uh, just to give you an idea of how it might work. This is an alert uh, that would pop up on your console. Um, this would be another alert. You can see here, uh, this firmware update might be legitimate. So in your SOC, when this alert shows up in their SIM, uh, we would advise you to have a workflow that has the SOC analyst know who they're supposed to call to find out if this was a legitimate firmware update by a control engineer or something potentially malicious. As we saw in the Triton attack, this would have helped tip people off that something was going on that shouldn't be going on. Second aspect is response. Uh, this is an example of an event timeline from our platform. It shows uh, different alerts. Some are, some are serious, some are more informational. Uh, but it would be a way to go back and do some forensics and say, what else happened uh, just before and just after this alert showed up on my screen? And then there's some extensive data mining tools that allow you to dig down deeper, um, down to the packet level if required, to understand from a forensic point of view what happened and also to do threat hunting in the environment. The next quadrant is about prediction. And the idea here is, how do I predict breaches? How do I model risk? With the goal of being better at vulnerability management, an interesting quote here, we know that ICS environments are notoriously insecure. They're very difficult to patch. Uh, they have Windows boxes that can't even be patched anymore. They have PLCs that almost never get patched. How do you deal with such a massive uh, challenge and what Gardner says is take a risk-based approach, prioritize what you need to patch. If you can't patch, find other mitigating or compensating controls, such as monitoring, uh, so you can quickly be alerted if someone's trying to exploit a vulnerability that you were unable to patch. And so for this, we've developed something we call automated ICS threat modeling. Uh, it uh, starts with this screen, which says, you know, Pick the asset that you consider your most critical asset, your target uh, asset, your crown jewel. And we're going to show you all the possible attack paths or attack vectors ranked by risk that an adversary could use to compromise this device. 
Um, and so if you look at the top there, there's uh, the top rated attack vector starts with control center number one, and then it draws a picture and it says, well, it turns out that control center number one in engineering workstation is actually connected to the internet. You may or may not have known this, uh, but this would be the way the attacker would get in. They would then exploit a series of Windows vulnerabilities on different devices, as you see in the diagram, to finally get to PLC 11, at which point they would exploit another vulnerability. This is now a PLC vulnerability known as Frosty URL, which turns out our threat intelligence team reported uh, to the CERT a couple years ago and it has since been patched, but you may not have patched it. And uh, what this allows you to do is then go and simulate how you might mitigate this attack path. You might choose to do a better job of segmentation. You might choose to only implement the patches that are shown here in this attack path. And then you can then see what other attack vectors show up and decide if you're willing to live with that risk or whether you need to keep going. And that's what we mean by automated ICS threat model. And then finally, the prevention quadrant up at the top right, um, certainly uh, blocking and firewalls are essential, but there are other aspects of prevention which uh, are characterized by hardening. So first of all, um, for example, we have a vulnerability assessment report that provides an overall objective risk score, risk score with uh, recommendations about how to improve the score over time. Uh, it provides uh, an asset map view and, and, and showing the connectivity between devices. So for many organizations, this may be the first time they actually have an accurate inventory of all their ICS devices. It shows detailed information about each device, what type of device it is, who's the manufacturer, what ports are open, and what CVs are associated with the device. And then finally, as we've been talking about remote access, uh, CyberX has been integrated with CyberArk, which is the leading remote access um, privilege session monitoring solution on the market so that we can check to make sure that when someone comes in over a remote access session, uh, SSH, uh, VNC, um, that, we, um, that they are an authorized session, that they came in through the privilege sessions, sessions manager and that it's an authorized session. And you can even see if the session is being recorded, which is uh, important for audit purposes. And then finally, I just want to wrap up with this question of who owns OT security, which was the last seminar that we did with SANS in December. It's generated a lot of interest in, in my conversations with security professionals in the ICS community. This turns out to be a big one because uh, what we're finding is that CISOs want to unify IT and OT security. They don't want to have to build a separate SOC. They don't want to have to you know, rebuild all of the processes, workflows that they've spent years building for the IT SOC, but they need visibility into the OT environment that they've never had before. Uh, and so what we've found works for creating a unified strategy around IT and OT security is number one, it needs top-down attention. We're all in this together. You know, when a plant gets shut down, it affects everyone, everyone's careers, everyone's stock options, everyone's growth path is affected by shutdowns in the production infrastructure. Number two, you need to do some cross-training because IT security folks don't understand how OT systems are different. They don't know about the, the different approaches to patching them and configuring them. Uh, and similarly, OT folks, by being put into the corporate shop can help analysts there understand what the right workflow would be when an alert shows up in the corporate shop related to an, IT, an ICS device. Uh, and uh, obviously establishing lines of communication to the OT engineers who really know what's going on in that environment is essential. And then finally, a platform like ours can provide deep and granular visibility into the OT environment to the corporate shop for the first time. What assets are there? How's the network set up? What protocols are being used? What vulnerabilities exist? Is there any malware? Um, and what that does is it allows the SOC analysts to use their existing workflows and processes, um, but with the added visibility they've never had before into the OT environment. And as part of that, we built a native app for Curator, um, the first ICS threat monitoring app for the curator environment that provides a much richer interface from the SIM than your standard syslog interface, which is 
fairly um, bare bones and uh, has limited information. With that, I invite you to check out our um, ICS and IoT security knowledge base on the website where you'll find uh, transcripts from past men's webinars if you don't want to sit through the whole video. Um, you'll uh, be able to get free downloads from ICS Hacking Exposed. By the way, our threat intelligence is featured in Chapter 7 of that book. Um, you'll get something called the Global ICS and IoT Risk Report where we analyze vulnerability data from 375 production ICS networks worldwide and uh, showed you um, sort of what the prevalence of different endpoint and network vulnerabilities was. So you can compare yourselves to what you see there. You'll all see uh, recordings that our threat researchers uh, have made at sessions at Black Hat and S418. And then a couple of other uh, events happening down there at the bottom, including the next one in London, where we're going to have a CISO, the CISO from Tiva Pharmaceuticals and the CISO from Scotia Gas Networks talking about how they are addressing ICS security. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Justin for the second part of the presentation. Justin? Thank you very much, Phil. Justin. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so. I want to really wrap up this session by really talking about what are some of the overall strategies or overall concepts that we need to be concerned with as we're going into and trying to defend against some of these attacks, especially in light of some of the newer attacks that are there. So if we go ahead and we look at, you know, the, the vulnerabilities that Phil presented and the malware that Phil presented over time, we actually definitely see an increase and in the frequency of these different types of, of compromises. Now, one thing that we need to understand, anytime we have a single compromise, there's going to be impacts to that compromise, and we're going to experience whatever those impacts are, be it a loss of a system, uh, loss of connectivity, or, or any other type of disruption to our processes, we're going to continue to experience that impact throughout the time period that we're trying to remediate it. So really, the greater the duration that it takes for us to try to remediate our vulnerabilities, the greater the damage we're going to have into our infrastructures, our our processes or our, our data sets themselves. And this can definitely mean both physical and digital loss. So while often inside of the ICS world, we are very hyper-focused on physical because of course, loss of a process can actually lead to um, life and limb, uh, threat to life and limb, as well as damage to the environment. But there's also that, that point of digital loss as well. For instance, uh, pharmaceutical companies losing their uh, historian data with all their recipes um, for the different drugs that they're actually doing, or um, oil and gas companies losing information to foreign nations or other competitors about how much oil and gas are pulling out at specific spots. All very, very confidential and very highly, you know, uh, uh, crown jewels type information to these organizations. So really, until that incident addressed, these losses will continue to increase as we go along. Now, specifically, we're really talking today about safety and some of these protection systems we have. Now, if you're not familiar with safety systems inside of the ICS world, generally the concept is this. If you have some type of a critical process that can have some uh, catastrophic uh, outcomes if you, we lose that process or lose control of that process, often what we'll do is we'll have a second controller or series controllers with their own connectivity, their own valves, their own controls, their own actuators, and often their own sensors, trying to monitor the health of this infrastructure. So if you see in this little diagram on the left-hand side, uh, those are gonna be two different controllers controlling you know, some type of a process on a pipeline. And you can see that we have a smaller controller kind of off to the right-hand side uh, that has its own connectivity down to its own valve. And so the concept here is if anything goes astray, so there's some type of a large weather event, there's going to be some type of uh, of a malfunction or miscommunication or a, a mistake on an operator's part, you know, the idea of the safety system is to immediately step in and try to mitigate the worst of the risks that could ever occur, right? So we could definitely experience degradation of our processes, loss of material, loss of time, loss of revenues, but the worst case scenarios of explosions and loss of life, loss of limb, damage to the environment should be mostly mitigated by the safety instrumented system. And so we often build our risk models inside of ICS 
around this assumption that that safety inter instrumented system is going to be there to try to mitigate that last mile or the, the greatest issues that are there for us. Now, when we have these safety systems, there's also very strong international standards, as well as certification of these safety systems, trying to measure how effective they are in, in mitigating that, um, those, those worst case scenarios, right? So we end up having 2V that can go through and, and do our certification. We can actually assign different uh, safety integrity levels or SILs uh, rated from one to four to determine how important that system is. And that all allows us to go through and have some type of a risk measurement or risk assessment process to, to help us understand where are the most important risks and the least important risks inside of our systems. Now, when we look at our traditional systems, if you look on this map, on the left-hand side, you kind of see more of a traditional safety system. So we have our safety technology kind of on that far left-hand side where it has its own sensors and actuators and it's evaluating the current health of the process. And if it identifies some type of an issue, it can immediately respond to be able to try to save that issue. Where just to the right of that, you'll see that automation box. That automation box represents the process itself that is being monitored, right? So our traditional safety systems would be something that's completely islanded, that's independently monitoring that process and can step in at, at, at any time to try to save it, often with no way for a manual influence to affect that. Well, over time, we started trying to realize that we can gain some benefits if we have a closer communications between our safety systems and the controllers themselves. So kind of the next phase or the generation two of our safety systems started having wiring and communications between our safety systems and our automation systems um, to be able to facilitate a lot of these different uh, benefits for, for having these devices communicate with each other and be able to understand what each side is doing. And if you look at our third generation or our latest type, of, of safety systems. We now have vendors selling different types of controllers with safety technology integrated into the controller itself. So maybe it's going to be a separate card inside of the same chassis or maybe separate internal functionality in the controller that is dedicated for that, that safety itself. Now, there's a lot of benefits to having that, in, that integration, right? By having it integrated, there's no additional hardware. We don't have to go through and run um, multiple lines of, of wiring cabling. We can have shorter response times uh, by having that integration. And it also makes it very easy for us to go through and create that proof of safety. Now, the one biggest problem though is in all areas, minus cybersecurity, there's a lot of benefits. But when it comes down to cybersecurity, that's something we're always afraid of. The more connectivity, the closer these technologies are, often the easier it is to try to bridge some of those technological defenses or separation um, areas inside of some of these systems. Now, these safety systems can be attacked too, and that's really what the whole presentation that we're talking about here is with the uh, the Triton um, vulnerabilities and malware that's actually come out. And if you haven't had a chance to learn about Triton, there's a lot of really great reports that are out there. Go check out the FireEye report that did a great uh, a great write up on it. Um, CyberX, uh, as as Phil mentioned, actually had a great blog post that goes through and and talks about some of their findings, a lot of which Phil actually just presented to us. Um, and then also go back to Schneider, the ones that are actually able to, the TriConnect systems, to understand and read some of their security vulnerability bolts and reports and, and some of the, the articles from them. And of course, no matter where you are in the world, uh, whichever government organization or CERT team that you are associated with, they also will have a lot of a good information out there for you as well. I think one of the biggest things that we have coming out of our safety systems is, is kind of a, a list of strategies or what are some things that we can do just from a defensive perspective, specifically around the safety systems themselves. So we need to remember specifically for the cyber attack surface for our safety systems, the more integration we have generally means the more attack surface we have. The closer that's together and the more communication going between the safety and the controller, the greater risk that we're going to have there. And we can try to mitigate that risk by trying to do uh, limiting the communications, try using something like a data diode so that information can only go one way, try using other types of security defenses like uh, Siemens has actually put in their TriConnect systems internally to the devices, try to limit some of the, the control and the, the flow of information internally. Um, but regardless, once again, we, it, on the most critical systems themselves, we just need to understand 
the more connectivity there is there, the more risk that's actually going to be there as well. And, and part of that risk is not going to be able to be mitigated um, to, to 100%. So when we're going through and doing it, traditional CIS connected to a primary controller um, is something that you know, prevents or creates some of those risks and the communication channels going back and forth that we can go ahead and look at, try to address and consider to see if there's some type of defensive control that we could place there. And then of course, remote access to our traditional SIS models uh, or any type of a controller that has an integrated safety system is something that we also want to be very careful of. That remote access is something we should definitely try to avoid if at all possible um, to the safety instrumented systems. Of course, some of our business requirements might, might mandate or might require that. So even having some type of a physical mechanism, very similar to the, the little switch, uh, the key switch that Phil was showing on the, the programming mode and the run mode on the TriConnect systems themselves, for remote access, we could do something very similar as well so that an engineer on site will be able to actually flip a switch to provide some level of remote access or some other type of uh, a mechanism where we can control exactly when that remote access occurs and does not occur. And of course, monitoring around that is going to be something that's very, very, uh, very important. So ultimately, the, the biggest recommendations is try to isolate these safety networks as much as you possibly can, right? The more insulation you have, the more layers of defense, and the more your teams have to do to actually get to them, to the controllers themselves, the more the attacker is going to have to to go through um, to be able to get to those systems, hopefully providing us many ways to identify, identify that the attacker's there. Now, one thing that we have in our SANS curriculum for ICS uh, curriculum here at SANS is we talk about different types of models that we can use to be able to try to organize what we're doing in the defensive nature. Um, one of those is, is having our sliding scale, we'll call it the sliding scale of cybersecurity, different areas that we can go ahead and look at to try to identify where we can be effective and where a lot of effort spent. Now, if we see on the left-hand side architecture, um, this is the architecture that we're actually building, both our, our IT and OT systems, but as well as all the security that we're actually placing them as well. So basically architecting, connecting them appropriately, and maintaining those systems by effective patching. Then you have the next two, passive defense and active defense. Now, if you're, you're, you're not familiar with this model, and you're no, more used to a traditional IT model, it's very easy to misunderstand what we mean by passive defense and active defense here. So passive defense and active defense in this specific model is actually talking more about how much manual effort is involved. Passive defense is going to be something like a firewall that we go ahead and we set protections on and that maintains those protections with very little maintenance by any, any of our, our cybersecurity staff, where active defense is going to be the types of analysis that we do from our different monitoring solutions and how we're actually trying to identify those breaches or trying to actively change and modify um, our defenses uh, during an incident itself. And then intelligence, intelligence is how we gather information, not just from external entities um, for cyber intelligence, but especially from inside of our infrastructure, inside of our systems themselves, and having that feedback into our active and passive defense. And then finally, offensive, um, different types of techniques. That's usually very minor what we're doing, but more the legal actions we can we can perform as well as, as some of the more self-defense countermeasures that we can perform inside of our infrastructures. Now of these, that active cyber defense cycle, um, where we actually have more humans involved and more of a manual effort, that's something that um, always needs a little bit more explanation. And this is kind of the, the, the graph or the zoom in of that active cyber defense. You know, so what are we actually doing with this? So really, when we talk about active cyber defense, these are, these are staff in our environments that are actually performing different types of active defenses, um, trying to, to identify and stop these attackers. That's all based around threat intelligence. We need to be able to identify what intelligence from our systems we have, identify the indicators of compromise, and then trying to proactively go after uh, these attackers that have breached our infrastructure. We want to go ahead and leverage our monitoring, our network monitoring security systems, um, trying to pull information to detect exactly where those attackers are. We need to be able to provide an organized systematic incident response so that we can systematically go through and try to contain those attackers and eradicate those attackers and do it in a very graceful way where we can recover our systems with as little interruption as possible. 
and then take whatever information we're gathering, gathering around the process with that threat and environment manipulation, modifying our environment to try to make it more difficult for that, that attacker to, to spread or to, to go further, further locations. So kind of more in the traditional idea of a containment um, process in our instant response. Now, one way we can actually do to try to have a systematic program to do this is by following some type of a cybersecurity framework. Now, of course, one of the most popular ones inside of the ICS world is IEC 62443, um, but that's one that's not always, uh, uh, it's not fully ratified. There's um, aspects of it that um, are, are sometimes very expensive to try to be able to purchase. Um, some of the documents that are there, as well as the detailed guidance there is, is, is sometimes a little bit of a challenge to try to go through and identify and follow. One of the options or one of the solutions that you could look at that we've had a lot of success here in North America is actually using the NIST cybersecurity framework or the CSF. The cybersecurity framework from NIST basically goes through and provides kind of a nice summarize. It's, it's a, think of it as kind of a, a, a summary or a, a simplification of the IEC 62443. Um, providing different major categories of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover um, in, in our, our overall systems. And then they will break them down into subcategories and subcategories below that, mostly integrated around different questions and, and idea or questions we can ask ourselves about what our maturity level is and what we've actually done inside of our infrastructure or what types of you know, possible locations we may be missing defenses. One thing that's very interesting about the NIST CSF is they are building manufacture or different profiles for the CFS for different parts of critical infrastructure. And here's an example of one they just did last fall for the manufacturing profile for CFS that goes through and tries to adapt the CFS model back down into something very specific to OT environments. Now, in summary, the last thing I wanted to, to mention was one, some of you on this call may have may have taken the ICS 410. That's our uh, security essentials for ICS and SCADA systems. Um, we've been running that course here at SANS for the last five years, and that's the course that prepares us for the GICSP certification. And we update that course twice every year. So I'm the I'm the author of that course, and we used to do one major update and one minor update um, every year that that we have that course. But one thing that it's, since it's been out for five years. We did do a very major overhaul of this course just recently. In fact, it's still going through the, the quality controls right now, but it's estimated to be launched in June of 2018, so just a few months away. And we wanted to bring that up to any of you that are interested in, in taking this course or for any of that you have taken this course, um, if you may have other individuals inside of your organizations that might be interested in it. So we we literally have about 30% new content that we've added to the course. We've also taken another 33% of the, the remaining content and did major overhauls and major upgrading of that content themselves. We really tried to focus on, on reordering and having a very systematic method and approach to presenting these ideas improved over the last one to really try to facilitate learning inside of the course. In fact, we've taken every single section of the course and actually mapped each section back to the standards, IEC 62443, the NIST CSF, as well as other standards like ISO 27001 um, and, and COVID. So we have a lot of different options there for depending on what types of standards your organization is following. Um, other major in sections that you might be interested in that we've included, we now have some strong discussions and even an exercise around field bus protocols and how do we defend against these traditional serial field bus protocols. We have exercises on that, that field bus. We also end up talking more about recommendations for how to specifically build ICS programs. So staffing, organization, reporting infrastructures, as well as frameworks. And in that, this, this system, we also will break down and uh, are now discussing much more in depth the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, breaking that down and providing that as a, as a recommendation alongside IE 62443 as, uh, as something that we can, we can do and be very effective inside of our, inside of our environment. And with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and include the the, uh, the WebEx and go ahead and pass that back over to uh, to Phil to see if there's any other questions. Hey, Justin. Yep. Thank you very much, Justin. That was excellent. Um, I had a comment from one of the participants uh, emphasizing a point that you made that safety systems should be 
uh, logically and uh, physically uh, separated from automation systems. Um, and uh, that's really something that you did emphasize. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour. I think um, I'll answer one or two questions uh, about our monitoring platform. Uh, does it impact the OT network? The answer is no. Uh, it uses passive monitoring, connects up through a network switch, a span port, and has zero impact uh, on the OT network because it's looking at a copy of the traffic. It's not in line, and it doesn't require uh, or use any agents on the devices. Uh, and then the, another question is how much, uh, you know, how many resources are required uh, to run the system? How easy is it to deploy? And uh, because we use a self-learning engine that is specifically designed for ICS environments, it has behavioral analytics that were specifically designed to detect uh, anomalous behavior in an ICS network and also has a deep embedded knowledge of ICS devices and protocols. Within an hour of connecting our system to your ICS network, you'll have insights about the assets on the network, vulnerabilities in the network, how the assets are connected, um, and whether there's any threats or malware in the network as well. Um, so wrapping up today's webinar, thank you again for your time. I hope you found it useful. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any additional questions. Phil at cyberx-labs.com. Thank you, Justin, for your help, and thank you, Carol at Sands, for uh, making all the logistics work for us today. Happy Easter. Happy Passover. All right. Well, thank you so much, Phil and Justin, for your great presentation, and to CyberX for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.